Um, so hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Building Mobility Justice uh, breakout session here at the Cal Bike Summit. My name is Axel Santana, I'm an associate at PolicyLink. Uh, I work on our transportation equity, mobility justice, water equity and climate resilience work. Um, just to name a few things that I work on um, as if it's not enough. Um, and I go by he, him, his pronouns. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, PolicyLink is a national research and action institute advancing racial and economic equity. We do that through communications, advocacy, and research. Do you go to the next slide? Oh, I have the next slide. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging the land that we're on, um, which is Ohlone and Chochenyo land. And just a reminder to acknowledge the indigenous lands that you all inhabit and to give, you know, any time or money or resources to support uh, local indigenous groups and give the land back to the indigenous groups that were here before us. Um, and thanks to Ginger for starting us off this morning with that uh, land acknowledgement as well. Um, we have a great session lined up for you today. Uh, I'll introduce our panel of awesome speakers. Um, we have John Yi from Los Angeles Walks, Executive Director with LA Walks, um, and Nicole Chang, Policy Assistant with Climate Plan. Um, and we were supposed to have another panelist, but uh, she was not able to make it up this morning. So um, we're just going to make do without her. We're going to make it work. Um, <laughs> thank you. And so uh, before we get to their presentations, I want to first say a little bit about um, the topic today. And so we'll be talking about mobility justice. And for those of you who are new to the space, mobility justice is about centering people over profit, property, or placemaking. And it's about prioritizing people's lived experiences. And it's the primary driver of change. And it emphasizes human infrastructure and emphasizes that projects enhance communities' experiences rather than erasing or displacing them. And to understand the history of America is to understand the pain and trauma that has been inflicted on indigenous communities communities, Black, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander communities, low-income communities, LGBTQ+, and disabled folks. The lens of mobility justice is to address those past wrongdoings of redlining, housing discrimination, lack of investment, and over-policing. It values community voices not only as essential data, but as leaders in their own liberation. Um, a main pillar of mobility justice is uh, includes rejecting increased policing as a viable solution to safe communities, as was discussed in previous panels um, and conversations throughout the day. We've seen time and time again that police can't be trusted to keep our communities safe. And we're looking for alternatives to safety that are rooted in community and culture and healing and repair. Um, addressing environmental racism and is also an important pillar, acknowledging that people of color and low-income communities have historically borne the brunt of environmental and climate disasters, whether they're human-made or natural. And we seek to rectify that um, and empower those who have uh, been suffering for so long. And at the end of the day, uh, it's all about power. Mobility justice is about cultivating collective cross-community power, and it's about lifting up the voices of the most impacted communities and ensuring they have a voice at the table and are just driving decisions within their own neighborhoods. Um, as you all know, mobility is so important for all of us. It's how we get around, whether we walk, bike, roll, or take transit. It's how we get to our jobs, uh, our appointments, groceries, our families, our social lives. And many marginalized people don't experience mobility in the way that they deserve to. Not everyone feels or is safe walking down or driving around town. And not everyone can easily access healthy food or medical care in their neighborhood. And public transit isn't always affordable, safe, or reliable for everyone. And so mobility, as you all know, is an intersectional issue, and it needs to be approached accordingly. And so about four years ago, I'll keep with this slide, Becca. <clears throat> about four years ago, a few organizations uh, came together to create a network of advocates doing this work around the state, um, doing organizing, advocacy, and policy work around mobility justice issues. And we are called the California Mobility Justice Advocates Network. We're made up of a bunch of different or organizations, including PolicyLink, um, California Walks, uh, Climate Plan, and, and several others. Um, and it really came out of a BIPOC mobility Justice Lab series hosted by People for Mobility Justice in LA. Yes, shout out to uh, PMJ. Um, and it's a BIPOC-led space. Uh, we meet monthly and we seek opportunities to collaborate and do work together. Um, some of the things we've done together include uh, hosting a few convenings, including a youth advocacy day at the Capitol a couple of years ago when it was safe to do so. 
And our most recent work has been developing this guiding principles document, which we're excited to share with you today. And our panelists will be speaking to more about in a bit. And so the goal of this document that we've developed is to put forth a set of principles that guide our work as a network and in the hopes of encouraging decision makers to center the community voice and wisdom uh, in mobility and transportation programs and projects. And we hope to advance deeper, more genuine, equitable and justice based community led approaches to city planning and the design of our built environment. And as we've seen time and time again, community engagement is an afterthought in planning. And as advocates, we really want to ensure that residents uh, and community leaders are at the forefront of their decision making. And so that's what we're here to talk to you about today. And uh, there's a QR code. So if you want to pull out your phone and check out the document in real time, you can do that. Um, and I'll share it again in a bit later. Um, so we have a great set of speakers to walk us through sections of the principles document, which we broke up into three categories, community, capacity, and cash. And this is not an extensive list of considerations, but more of a conversation starter uh, between advocates and decision makers. And so in the document, we share, we share a little history of, as a reminder of the fact that these disparities didn't happen by accident, that they're a result of policies and actions taken by those in power and a direct product of the racist, homophobic, ableist, patriarchal systems that have been created to keep our people marginalized. We also touch on the impact that COVID has had on this movement and how we need to leverage this time to make long lasting changes to improve our communities to be more equitable rather than trying to get back to what was deemed as normal, uh, but clearly wasn't working for most of us. And so in this document, we outline some promising practices associated with each principle and include resources and links to case examples where these kinds of actions are already happening and taking place across the state. So once we hear from our speakers, we'll have some time at the end for questions uh, from the audience. And so please write them down or keep a mental note. And so with that, I'll pass it to John to start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Can you all hear me? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Hi, my name is John. I'm with Los Angeles Fox. Do um, you want to do introductions a little bit so they can know who we are? <laughs> okay, yeah. So I'm John with Los Angeles Fox. Um, I'm the executive director. We're a nonprofit that does pedestrian advocacy. Uh, my background is a community organizer. So before this, I did organizing work around tobacco, before that, around schools. Um, and so for me, power building with communities to reach an objective and a goal. I also do community organizing within my personal life. I live in Koreatown, second generation Korean American living in K Town, LA. So I do a lot of work there too. But this is my jam. I enjoy this stuff. I'm always learning and growing. And so I hope you all learn and grow with us today. Hi, I'm Nicole. Um, sorry, this is the first time speaking in mic. I don't know if this is working. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm a policy assistant with Climate Plan. And essentially, we're a statewide network organization that works on the issues of transportation, housing, um, climate policy, and e equity. Um, and I don't come from a community organizing background, more of a research background, um, which is what I mainly do. But um, that's what I want to do and aspire to do is like be uh, community organizing and kind of come from this mobility framework uh, mindset. And I'll pass it back to John. Thanks. All right, so let's... Get my notes. Sorry. Let's start right in. So, as was shared, um, this document mobility just means a lot. I think you can define it every different ways. I think in this room, we can probably define it every different way. And so, for the sake of this conversation, I think it's worth noting that um, it's a very specific definition that we set as a group. We're not claiming that it is the definition, but it is our definition, and hopefully, it serves as a guidance. And so, this was as Axel was sharing. This was like months and months of work, collaboration, and discussions uh, that kind of came down into those these three categories. Which we'll go through today. So let's start with community. Community, let's just read this out loud. Residents know their communities best. Therefore, we should listen to and trust their opinions, decisions, and wisdom when solving the biggest challenges. Next slide, please. So when I, when I when we go through this, I kind of want you to see this as like, you know, rose tint glasses, you put them on, everything's slightly like pink. <laughs> Think of this as the mobility justice glasses, the lens in which we view our work, whether it's our community work, whether we're engaging elected officials, whether we're engaging our own family. But this is the lens in which we see this work and see sort of not just the work, but the movement. So I'm going to go through these uh, one by one. 
By the way, this was a section that my colleague was supposed to do that she's not here, so I apologize if it's not as dynamic. <laughs> I'm hopefully better with my section. So um, the first principle is, uh, principle is local BIPOC communities. By the way, who knows what BIPOC means? Can someone tell me what that means? Thank you. Just black indigenous people of color. Thank you. Local BIPOC communities shape, define, and lead best practices. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. We know what is best for our communities. And so we should be considered the experts of our community and our community design. Second is community voices are essential data and decision making. And I think this is another component that kind of is the first is we know the resources, we know what our community needs. And I think the word data is particularly important because oftentimes people think of data as what? Numbers. numbers, exactly. But data is not often always numbers. Data can be anecdotes. But what if you can't write? What if you can't read, right? What is your data then? You still have data, of course. It could be stories, it could be a performance. And so there's so many ways of looking at data that I think is still short-sighted, but uh, I wanted to make sure we added in that the community voice isn't just about numbers, isn't just about a survey you fill out on a Likert scale. It's far more dynamic than that. Third, BIPOC leaders, decision makers, uh, have authentic power. And so this goes back down to power and power and power. Are we putting our communities in positions where they can actually make the changes, right? Or are they just volunteers? Are they just community advocates we give stipends out to? Are we actually ceding power to our communities and giving them the, the power to make their own decisions? Third, accessibility is intersectional. Um, this really means a lot to me as a pedestrian advocate. Oftentimes, and I'm kind of jealous, being here today, I see a lot of sort of the differences between the bike advocacy world and the pedestrian advocacy world. And one area is definitely, we don't have a built-in business model. I know, which sometimes we did. I wish we had shoe companies who would support our issues the way bike companies do. <laughs> I think the reason I bring this up is when I talk to someone about pedestrian issues, I never begin it with saying, how is it being a pedestrian? It always begins with them telling me about how hard it is to walk to school, how difficult it is to go to, a, to wait in the baking sun at a stop bus stop, right? Exactly, yeah, the lack of shade. So... This issue by nature is intersectional, but if you don't see it as intersectional, you're looking at a very narrow scope. And so I think this is important because communities know this. This isn't something foreign to community members. Communities know this in, like viscerally. So I think that's another principle. And then finally, the last principle is BIPOC communities develop their own solutions for safe streets. So like I said before, we are experts of our community. We are experts of our fields. Um, and oftentimes it's not just experts of my physical geography. If I know how to engage a second generation or first generation Korean American community, I can help that engagement in other parts of the city where that diaspora may be. So it's not just me and my city, it's also me and my community, which go beyond your physical boundaries. So with that, next slide. So I want to say that these are not really, actually, can we go back a slide? <laughs> these are not extraordinary, right? These are not that foreign. I think everyone agrees this is something that we all agree with. And actually, if you just took BIPOC away and said, communities in general deserve these things, we'd all still agree. But the fact that this is so out of reach for a lot of BIPOC communities goes to show that something so basic, something so expected, is something that's so difficult to get. So I think that is why we've got to really frame this, not just as all communities deserve this, but really BIPOC communities deserve this. All right, next. So um, the California Walks, uh, that's not my group, but my, my colleague's group, Gato Vero's group, um, but, oh my God, Gato Vero, sorry. Um, this is uh, some sort of the work that California Walks is doing. And I know one of the things they're really committed to do is working with communities, doing workshops, doing training, trying to build the capacity, which we'll get into in a second, of communities to engage power, move power, and have power respond to them. And at times become power itself, whether it's running for office. Um, and so I think this is sort of the work that they do at California Walks. Next slide. And for those interested, um, they do have a program called the Community Safety Ambassador Training Program, where they do this kind of training. So I really encourage everyone to reach out to California Walks uh, if you want to participate in this. I think they get grants to do these kind of trainings throughout uh, the state. And so they even come down to Cal LA to do some of these trainings. So. All right, which I think then takes us to the next part, which is capacity, right? What good are these principles if we can't actually implement them, if the community can't actually practice them? They're just words on a paper, right? And so oftentimes what I hear is, we need to build the community's capacity. We need to build the community's capacity. It's often something that I hear very often. So next slide. 
So for this section, we have three principles that we want to we want to sort of go over. Uh, the first is systems, processes, and structures are unequivocally accessible and reflective of BIPOC communities. Um, and so this is just a long way of saying our systems serve those that it's intended to serve, right? And so for us to change the system, we need to actually start thinking about how do we create these spaces to become more receptive to communities of color, to BIPOC communities. And so this isn't just applicable to government. It could be applicable to your nonprofit, to your community group, your housing association, your neighborhood council. But are you making these places accessible to BIPOC communities? And so a few examples that we do at Los Angeles Walks is, you know, we make sure that we have the meeting happen at a time that is actually accessible, right? And we're not doing it at 11.30 a.m. when people are at work. We provide childcare. We provide incentives and um, sort of what's called um, support for transportation. Not everyone can get to where you are in a meeting. Oftentimes, it's in a government building, so people who are undocumented can't enter in. So space is incredibly important. Are you having it where it's actually accessible physically? Other things is childcare. In all of our meetings, we make sure we have childcare because parents are parents, right? They might not be able to drop their kid off or have someone watch their kid. So an example I often like to share is sometimes we have meetings in parks and what we do is we put the chairs out in sort of like a semicircle, like a moon, and we have to face a playground. So the parents can talk, but at the same time as they're talking, they can keep an eye out on their kid. Basic stuff like that provides accessibility. But if you have it in a stuffy boardroom where it's inaccessible people without documents, we have no childcare, they're not gonna show up and you shouldn't be surprised if they don't show up. Also important is food. People bond over food. You should never underestimate food. Breaking bread is one way to really break community. And so if you have a community meeting without food, I'm not going to be there. <laughs> um, another thing, I, the second point then is inaccessible systems demand more but provide much less to BIPOC communities. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. And I, something that, how many of y'all grew up in a church or have gone to a church? All right. How many of y'all are involved with like your, your community, whether it's like a local bike club, whether it's like a local like neighborhood association? So we're all involved with our own pockets of communities, right? Where we have community, we understand each other, we see each other. Imagine the feeling in that space, right? Of camaraderie, of understanding, the consensus building that happens there. How do you replicate that kind of mood within the government spaces, within your community meetings, within your community outreach? You know, I think of like growing up in second generation Korean church, the dynamic in that space is completely different than the dynamic in this room, in this conference, in city council meetings. But I always think if I want to bring Korean American first gens to a city council meeting, how do I show them that the dynamic that they see that they're comfortable with in the church is also possible in city council meetings? So that's the level of engagement we have to do with different communities, right? We have to think about what it is their experience is like. And so we go to the next slide. So something that I want to say before I go on to this is, um, in the beginning, I say, I often hear we need to build capacity. We need to build capacity of communities. They have grants and foundations give out money to build capacity for communities. And often what that means is we need to get immigrants, people of color, to learn English, to use Twitter, to use Zoom, and call in at a city council meeting and be able to get their points in within 30 seconds. That is often what capacity means for a lot of folks, which is incredibly unfair. We're putting an immense amount of burden on people already disadvantaged are already out of reach of power to build this stuff so they can engage power. When often I think we should be building the capacity of power because they have the resources to the government to collect our taxes. So how is government reaching our communities? An example I often bring up is, sorry, I keep bringing up my own story, but that's how you connect, right? As a Korean American, there's an app called Kakao Talk. Anyone heard of it? Okay, I got a head shake. I'm sure if there was a Korean person in this room, they're like, yeah, my mom has it. If you're Chinese, it's WeChat. Uh, for the Spanish speaking community, Latino community, it's WhatsApp. Who said it? Yeah, WhatsApp. But do you see governments in these spaces? I have not. The pandemic, when everyone moved online, I have not. So is government also building their own capacity to reach community? So I think there's got to be a little bit of both, a little bit of a give and take. So the next one is BIPOC communities and their trusted organizations have the capacity and resources to shape the outcome. Experts should be paid like experts, or so they say. There's Yolanda. Oh, she's not here. Okay. Oh, Yolanda. Yolanda. 
<laughs> no, it's all good. Yeah. So I think I, 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 the reason I bring up Yolanda is because she began as a community advocate, showed the city what good community organizing was, and the community realized we need to bring her in. We need to pay her. We need to have her represent LADOT and do the work. And she's been kicking ass since. Kicking ass before, what am I saying? But I think that is incredibly important. Um, the picture here is actually our promotoras. And so what we do at the Los Angeles Walks is we developed a Safe Street Promotora program. And much like who knows what a promotora is in the public health. There we go, all right. So for those who don't know, promotora is a very, is an established sort of profession in the public health world where if you have a community with language issue, not language access issues, cultural access issues, instead of having a professional organizer like John Yee or a city staffer coming into a community, setting up tent and saying, I'm gonna give you resources. What you do is you give the resources to a community member themselves, train them, and then have them go out into their own neighborhood. So similarly in transportation, Securing life-saving infrastructure is so difficult, just like healthcare. And so what we did is we trained community promotoras who are next expert navigators of city systems. And what they do is then they then train their own peers to secure life-saving infrastructure. So these are promotoras who are actually partnered with LACBC, the Bike Coalition, and they're training their peers on e-bikes because they're going to actually have a contract now with LADOT to go and they're paid for it, right? And they're, they're being paid to go out and now talk to businesses to adopt e-bikes bikes um, for deliveries. And so for us, this is how you pay community members. We would not, actually, I shouldn't say that. We should do more. We're, this is the best we can do right now. But this is a level of payment and of respect I think we need to communities. And it goes with first paying them contracts. And the number of city contracts that I've seen where they actually hire people from outside the state to come in and do community engagement work, it's really appalling. Like we were in a bit, we were actually applying for a contract with the city. And there was a firm in Miami Miami, who was going to lead the community engagement work. And they got, I think, $100,000 of a million dollar contract, and they only gave us $10,000. When it was based in Koreatown, and they brought us on because I have my Koreatown background. So it just goes to show you how messed up just the, the contracting system. I could go on and on about that. But. <laughs> so we'll go on to the next one. Finally, government must build their capacity to acknowledge and reconcile past harms. I think this is incredibly important. It's two sides of the coin, acknowledge and reconcile. I see a lot of acknowledging, but I don't see a lot of reconciliation. Um, after the civil unrest that happened, you know, uh, a few summers back during the BLM movement, we saw a lot of statements coming out from transit agencies about how messed up they, they were, how they're gonna do better, you know, and companies started pulling that out. But what was the response? What are you actually doing, all right? And so what I would say is, at the end of the day, it's really simple. It's about money and power. Are you giving up money and are you giving up power? If you're not doing either, then you're not doing your work. You're just acknowledging you're not reconciling. And this isn't just with governments. This is all your, your board. It's your neighborhood association. It's your local clubs. Are you giving up power and are you giving up money um, to the communities that you're serving? Or are you just building new programs to serve that community while hoarding the money but saying that you're building them, you're building these programs to serve them. So I think it goes back to it's it's pretty simple. I don't know how more to say it, but are you giving up money? Are you giving up power? And so sort of the ways that we've done it at Los Angeles Walks is actually we move towards a flat pay structure. So one of the staff members had to reduce their salary for other staff to raise their salary. And we willingly did this because we realized having an unequal pay structure isn't right, isn't gonna work for us. When it comes to writing grants, we actually, promotoras, we actually bring our promotoras in to, tell, to work with them on drafting the grants, drafting the budget. When we do our budgets, we make sure that what we're paid as staff is the same rate as that we're asking that them to pay our promotoras. So again, how are you bringing them into this work? I think there's participatory budgeting that people talk about when it comes to developing your organization's budget with the community. You know, that also goes into program building. Are you building the program to the community? With our promotoras, we built a 10-month training curriculum, but we realized we really can't build that on our own. We have to build it with them because by building it with the community, they actually have skin in the game and they're willing to run through with it as opposed to if you came sort of, sort of a spaceship and you dropped it down. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my notes. Yeah, and so I think I'll end it with this. What does reconciliation look like to you in your world, in your community, in your home even, right? And are you doing what, are you giving up money and power to reconcile? So I will end it with that. Thank you, John. Let's give it up for John.
Thanks for those remarks and your great work. And if you have questions for John, save them and we'll have some time at the end to, to share. Um, so now we'll pass it on to Nicole to tell us about the cash principle in the document. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll be expanding more on the money concept that John was talking about. Um, so with cash, there needs to be a transparency and funding methods and allocations to ensure that the public knows where the dollars are being spent and make sure that it's in an equitable manner. So on the next slide, um, the first thing that th should happen is that BIPOC community should receive meaningful um, investments from progressive revenue sources. So as Axel was saying before, there's an undeniable um, inequity that is clearly there because of the disinvestment from in communities of color. Um, so there needs to be an investment in transit, in housing, um, in parks, and there needs to be transparency and ensure that these communities are a part of the conversation. Um, so, and also there needs to be an establishment of a funding pot to make sure that the there's continuous and sustainable revenue. Um, I think in terms of what Climate Plan has been doing, we haven't, we are not really like a community organizing. We're more on the statewide level and more focused on the policy. So um, we've been trying to allocate for, not allocate, but advocate for more transparent funding um, just making sure that when we attend the guidelines um, workshops that states hold, um, we make sure that it's like transparent and make sure that communities are involved in the conversation. Um, on the next slide, it talks about BIPOC communities receiving um, compensation as professional experts. So that's basically what John was saying before. Um, don't pay the researchers or a third party. Um, pay the people that are the community experts. Um, and so some actions that you could take to do that would be to allocate dollars to, f to fund the meaningful community collaboration and also leverage ph philanthropic funds um, to empower residents to advocate for their own needs. Um, on the next slide, it talks about participatory budgeting. Um, and as John was saying, it's more of a democratized way to allocate funding because people are coming up with the solutions and then they vote on what needs to be funded. Um, and one of the ways to implement this is to ensure that it's um, a best practice in transportation funding. So essentially all transportation um, agencies that are applying for funding would have to do like participatory budgeting as a way to get community engaged um, and things like that. Um, on the last, um, slide is mobility investments and the need to provide inter intersectional benefits and avoid harms. Um, and this is basically where Climate Plan has been working um, for the most part, because we've been trying to um, make sure that our transportation funding is aligned with our climate goals. And we're also pushing them to align with our climate or our equity and public health goals. Um, and so we're requiring mobility investments to include anti-displacement, climate resilience, and increasing transit priorities. Um, so make sure that not only are we allowing bike infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure in to be like fundable, but to prioritize these projects when they come across state agencies. Um, we also want to encourage investments to go beyond human needs and um, a sense of com community and culture. Um, while we don't really advocate for that, but I think that's really important to bring up um, that funding doesn't just go towards this, but it's like going towards a sense of art. Um, as we can see in the room, it looks, it looks much better and much community. Um, and then we also want to empower BIPOC communities to design investments. Um, so I think on the screen, or what was on the screen, was a um, California Transportation Funding Report Card. And this kind of gets into the boring parts of policy. Essentially, it looks at transportation funding guidelines and tells you what has been in um, those guidelines. So do these transportation um, agencies require anti-displacement transit priorities? And most of the time, um, they don't. 
And that knowing that, I think with this report card, you get to understand what to advocate for in terms of um, what to ask transportation agencies to make it make sure that the mobility justice framework is implemented. And I could pass it back to Axel. Thank you, Nicole. Let's give it up for Nicole. <laughs> Thank you, John and Nicole. Um, so just wrapping up that principles conversation, you know, we really hope, as I mentioned, uh, that this will just be a starting conversation uh, between advocates and decision makers. We really hope that city planners, researchers, um, community organizers, and other folks who are responsible for making these decisions um, really look at these principles and think about what does it take to actually have equity and mobility justice within their communities. So um, any way you can help us, you know, spread the word, uh, feel free to, to connect with us. Um, before we go to questions from the audience, um, just want to quickly ask our, our panelists to spend a couple moments telling us a little bit about some of the biggest challenges in your work and some of the solutions that you're most excited about. I guess I have to start because I have the microphone. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges for me is going into transportation funding and all the nitty gritty. There's um, something that I feel like is like insider knowledge, which is basically chart C. And if you look at that and look it up, like transportation chart C, it's this really complex matrix of where funding is going. And I think is like trying to translate that information into something um, usable is very um, complicated for me and also it's just like on a personal level trying to implement the mobility justice framework because as I said before I come from a researcher background and I feel like that in a way um, has like a different mindset than like community organizing in the mobility justice framework. And we're trying to change that, right? <laughs> yeah. I think for me, a big challenge is, I mean, if you ask someone on my team, they'll probably give you a different answer. But since I do a lot of the development work, it's just funding. There's just not enough money out there for this kind of work. And I'm sure the EDs that, that run these organizations understand that the number of grants that I've seen where they ask a community to pass a law under a year, Okay, like what? <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. And they, they give out money for that and then they cut the money after a year. So it's like, yeah, change the world in a year and good luck. There's just not, and this isn't, it's not just a foundation thing and grants. It's also with con city contracts. If you want to do work that involves a community, you have to start with year zero, not with year one. You got to build from the bottom up and there's just not enough money out there that's really dedicated to this kind of hard work. I think the public health, I come from the public health world. So I did tobacco organizing. Good God, if you want to see a field, that knows how to put money into issues and actually work with communities. You look at public health. I, I came from actually California's tobacco control program. The state of California decided to tax ourselves millions of dollars to then funnel in and combat tobacco. And California has one of the lowest rates of smoking. We have the most progressive laws around tobacco. And it's because we put money behind it, but we just don't have that kind of patience um, or foresight, I think, amongst fund the funding class to really do that. So funding is a big problem of ours. Yeah, I hear that, John. I think even at policy link where we sit as an intermediary trying to you know bring movements together and make sure that things are intersectional we struggle with building that momentum you know folks are, are busy on the ground limited capacity not able to take on bigger projects um, and just really hyper focused on their local fights and so it's hard to to build that build bigger movement whether it's statewide regionally or, or nationally um, so I can only imagine you know at a grassroots level what that looks like but um, I think it, it ripples really up, up the ladder um, so with that, I think we'll start taking some questions from the audience. And I think we had an eager Yolanda up here, <laughs> if you want to start us off. And I can come around with the mic. OK, thanks. Um, John, you know, I, I didn't realize the kind of the structure um, that LA Walks has now in terms of working with the community and the way
way you had to do the shifting with the the salary. So uh, when my hat's off, first off, that you guys just took that step. It almost sounds like a co-op type of um, you know approach. And so I wanted to find out kind of what kind of model did you base that on? Because um, and and how do you see that long term? You know, working in terms of building maybe more advocates and and creating kind of this new path. Yeah, Yolanda, the flat pay structure is not an easy thing because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an egalitarian system within your, your, your organization, which is great, but you still operate within a capitalist system. So let's say I'm gone one day and they, they need to hire a new executive director. That ED might want a high salary, or if the board wants to hire someone that's quality, they might need to raise a salary. So even you might make the changes within your own world, you still operate in a torrent, in a river that's rushing by you. And so you got to balance this. You need a good board, and I don't have the answers, I'll be honest with you. But I, we're just trying our best day by day. <laughs> Did you want to ask her? <laughs> so, John, you might have run into my mom, Esther Schiller. She worked in tobacco control. Oh, my God, I love and, Esther. Yeah, she's... <laughs> Um, anyway, the, so you bringing up the tobacco models, yeah, she's, we can talk later. We can talk later. Um, anyway, the tobacco model was, so first of all, all the, many of the state uh, attorneys general sued the tobacco companies, if you remember that, and there was a settlement, and all the states got a piece of that, and then California also passed the tobacco tax. So we, we kind of collectively agreed that cigarettes are bad, and it's okay to tax people who buy them and encourage people to not smoke and also make more non-smoking spaces. The, the analogous situation in our world would be cars are bad. And that's a little harder sell at the moment, although I think we're getting there. There's funding mechanisms like a gas tax, yes. and congestion pricing. There's a ways the government can collect money and then funnel that money into community work. To and all those, all that money goes to highways right now. Exactly. So we have to divert the stream. Anyway, more of a comment than a question. Yeah, thanks for that. And there's also um, a pilot program happening uh, in California around uh, road usage charge as well. So with the electric electrification of vehicles, making sure that it's not just a gas tax uh, for that. Hey, John, great presentation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the board? I know that um, usually it's pretty vertical. A lot of them are donors usually. Um, if you like to have some power over the direction of the organization, did you have to show them that model first, or, or you tell me more about how you how you did that? My board's pretty progressive, uh, and so it wasn't that hard to convince the board. Um, but then the concern did come up about like, what if one day I leave, or one of other staffers leave, and we need to hire someone with a higher salary? So I think they're aware of that challenge, but they're willing to take that risk. So you need a board that's willing to jump with you. Again, I think the, if you ask any of our board, what is the future of this? They don't. They wouldn't be able to answer. I can't even answer that right now. So I think we're just taking it day by day. Oh, I'm already on my way over here because I saw someone. I'll come back to you, Ginger. Thanks. So as you've been implementing this newer model uh, that you're presenting on, what have been some of the challenges that you face, whether that's internally or externally, and how you've overcome, overcome them or are working on it? Both of you. <laughs> Um, I think I might need to talk. Okay. Um, sorry, I completely forgot your question. So the challenges as you've been working in this direction and in this new okay. kind of approach, um, I guess, kind of from both of your perspectives. So I'll talk about a promotora program because I think that's one of our most innovative ways of approaching because a lot of community groups, I'm sure y'all part of bike clubs where you have a traditional nonprofit and you have membership, whether they pay a fee or they're part of as volunteers. For us, we, our membership, quote unquote membership is our promotoras. And what we do is as we secure city contracts, we bake them into those contracts so that they get paid for their work. They build their resumes, they build that experience so that one day, hopefully, like the public health department, our transportation department will create their own promotora program and then hire them full time. And so I'm really looking at, at, at sorry, Yolanda, to bring you up again, but the trail that Yolanda's blazing is I think something that has to happen in every transit agency. The way 
that they're doing in public health. But a challenge that we're facing is, is our undocumented mothers, to be even more specific, is how do we pay them that's not under $600, because if you go under over $600, you have to require their tax information, yada, yada, yada. How do we pay them so they're not just like volunteers and we're giving them stipends or a gift card to Starbucks? How are we giving them hard cash? And then not only giving them cash, but treating them with dignity when we give them the check, instead of having to do all these weird sort of securitous ways to get them money. And I think right now that is the biggest challenge that we have is compensating and paying our undocumented promotoras. I think more on the statewide policy side is just um, all the red tape that happens with funding. Um, so the, a lot with transportation funding, a lot of it's like funneled towards roads and highways just because of the way that we've structured our um, and made law. So I think it's like trying to get rid of the red tape and also um, ask, um, yeah, just getting rid of the red tape is like, Yes. Um, so with Climate Plan, we're, we have a, we're co-sponsoring a law that's like AB 2438, which essentially is trying to get um, the Climate Action Plan for Transportation Infrastructure into um, the transportation plans. And the transportation plans would better consider like climate um, resilience and equity within their um, planning process. I'll just add from our perspective, um, it's, it goes back to the capacity, as John was mentioning, about um, grassroots and community-based organizations being able to connect at the statewide policy level when they're so hyper-focused on their local fights. And it does impact them, right? But they don't always have the capacity to be able to engage. And so how do we, as an intermediary, make sure we can be that bridge and that liaison between the statewide policy work, federal policy, and local policy? So that's something that comes up often. Hey, I'm so excited to be in the room with y'all. Um, and I have a, I don't have so much a question, but as this thing that I've been kicking around in my head around mobility justice, and uh, I'm Ginger Jui, the executive director of Bike East Bay. And it really has to do with the first slide y'all put in here, which is the fun, fundamental tenet of mobility justice, which is we are listening to and respecting the wisdom of our communities of color. And something that I've been thinking about and we've been struggling with here in Oakland is that communities of color are still in the torrent of, of capitalist car culture. And when uh, us as mobility justice advocates and active transportation enthusiasts are going out there and say, hey, we're gonna take away your parking and put in bike lanes, people don't feel good about it because our communities of color are still embedded within um, you know, our car culture. And so something that I've been thinking about is adding on to our um, vision of ourselves as mobility justice advocates, as also like culture builders and storytellers, um, because in one way, the, the really loud lesson that we want to tell the decision makers, hey, listen to communities of color, it, that's like for the decision makers and for us, we also have to do um, like culture change work within our own communities. And in that way, we have to be leaders, you know, like if we listen to people, we're still going to get <laughs> orange juice all over the floor. <laughs> If we, if we listen to like what our communities of color are, are saying right now, what it might result in is like the Slow Streets program in Oakland where uh, they were really successful in white neighborhoods and then people hated them and we took them out in the black and brown neighborhoods. Um, and, and that again results in inequity. So this is kind of a thing I wanna just like shoot out there, see like what your experience is. Have you been thinking about this? you know tell me more so I do a lot of organizing, like campaign organizing. I'm pretty involved with the Democratic Club in LA. And I do a lot of canvassing in Koreatown. And Koreatown, if you've been in LA, is a very dense, so a lot of apartment buildings. So I go down, and when the gate opens, I run in to access the doors. And so I often go through the garage. People, people know what I mean here, right? 
And I can tell you, you can go to the most wealthiest building, to the most low income, the poorest of poor Koreans. Every car is going to be a black Mercedes or a Lexus. Always. That, that low-income family will have a church car and a regular car they take to work. So, yes, car culture is embedded not just in wealthy, well-to-do communities, but even in our communities, immigrant communities. And especially, especially yeah, it's because it's a wealth. It's a symbol of status. It's how you get there. And so I never, I, I, though I listen to the podcast War on Cars in the field, I never say I'm anti-car because I will alienate so many of our community members because they rely on their cars for daily life. They struggle every day to find parking because parking is so difficult. So I think you're totally, uh, these conversations are nuanced. And the panel before I was talking about jaywalking laws. When you talk about jay decriminalizing jaywalking, when you talk about decriminalizing jaywalking with first gen Koreans, they'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? That law is there to protect pedestrians. So it's about law and order in their perspective. And I get it. You know, they, their community is incredibly dangerous. And so this law makes sense. So I think there has to be understanding and conversations that are tough and difficult. But again, you can't be as a community organizer, you can't be ideological. You can be ideological if you're doing something else, but at least as an organizer, you can't be ideological. You have to meet your community where they're at and then move from there. Yeah, I appreciate that comment, Ginger. Um, and I think it really, for me, it, it makes me think that it all goes back to funding our public transportation and transit systems. Because if we had efficient, affordable, effective systems, we wouldn't have to be so car reliant. And yes, there would be, you know, as you could rent a car, do whatever you need to do if you need to like lug some stuff around, whatever. But we wouldn't be so car dependent if we actually had systems that worked for people, right? Um, so I think, yeah, funding transportation and, and transit is, is another piece to remember. And I don't know if you want to say anything about that, Nicole. No, I think you covered it. Um, I'm really excited that you have the Promotoras program. Promotoras is like a special place in my heart. Um, and that is something that I would love to bring um, to our community. Um, I wanted to know, um, have you noticed the impact that they, um, I guess, share? Um, some of the challenge, or I guess my thoughts are like, like, how am I going to, like, how do I sell this? idea of um, to my parents you know to my grandparents and um, in working specifically with the Spanish speaking community and so kind of like what are some of the um, like the wins that 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 the promotoras have been able to see in their community so not just like outcomes right like oh um, you're gonna do 10 lessons go out to your communities and tell 10 people about it but like what is the actual impact that the promotoras program um, is doing in the communities I love that question because in order to build, and this is not just promotoras, but in order to start a promotora program, you have to have trust, right? They have to trust you to participate in this program. So the first thing we did is we asked them, how do we serve you? You want a speed hump? Let's get a speed hump here. You want a decorative crosswalk on Figanel, which we just got in January for $75,000 that the city paid for. We'll get that for you. We'll organize that. And so the first thing is, what are you as an organizer bringing to the table that they'll actually benefit from? Start with that. And so that's, we spent three years just doing that, getting speed humps crosswalks, bus furniture, um, and the, the big crosswalk that I just mentioned. After you do that, then, I don't know about creating a promotor in another field, but this is how we did it. When you start doing that, the community, as they go through that campaign, go through that struggle, they just realize how messed up the system is. And then from there, we're like, you know, you can actually make money off of this. Those people over there, they're making money off of this. They're the quote unquote experts. So why can't you be experts? And so we bring in the, the promotor model in the public health. It's been done before, right? Why don't we replicate it? And so I think it's, it's a conversation you have to have. It's not going to be done within a year. And I'm sure you have the trust of your community, so maybe you can start it now. But I think you need to build that, again, year zero. You need to build that trust first. And then I think you can, you can do a Promotora program. Hi, John. <laughs> I appreciate your perspective about um, listening to the locals at the experts. You made it sound in the first slide, though, that there was agreement right away about what things to do. And we know there's often not. That's more common that there's going to be disagreement on what needs to be done. So how have you how have you overcome or built consensus when there are diametrically opposed opposing views on things? 
I would actually correct a premise in what you're saying. It is not my job to build consensus. That's not my role. That is the community's role to develop their own consensus. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not being cheeky, but, uh, but I think what you, as a good organizer, your job is, is to build a table to facilitate, I'm sorry, to facilitate building a table where the rules are very clear amongst the community, right? This is how we come to an agreement. This is how we resolve tension. This is how, if we have discord, we resolve it. You need to build that initial table, but to have that table, you need to have trust. You need to see each other, you need to break bread. And I know this sounds really lovey-dovey because we come from the government world where it's not like this at all. And so I think, you, again, as an organizer, I'm not here to tell you what to do or to, to say, or to say you're right, you're wrong, but to help build mutual rules and how we come to a consensus and agree. But again, that takes time and money. And unless you're willing to put time and money, I wouldn't recommend you do it then because it's, it's, it's work. It makes me think of the phrase moving at the speed of trust, which I feel like I heard a year ago and now I, it applies to everything. Thank you. Thank you. This is really great. Um, I work for the government. I am really interested in the participatory budgeting that you mentioned, and I'm wondering if either of you have examples that you could give where this has worked, and particularly where it's worked in a BIPOC community. It's okay if you say no, I don't have examples. Oh, I wish I did, but I was supposed to do the research on this. I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> That's a, so what we have... <sighs> Oh, that's a good question because if I want to bring my community members into building my budget with them, I first have to explain what a budget is, why nonprofits have budgets. Because uh, I, I learned that through my professional. No one taught me that. I had to learn it as I did. So it's not like they're going to learn it as well. So I have to train about what a budget is. I got to talk about revenue streams. I got to talk about balancing the budget sheet and all of that. And so that is something that we at Los Angeles Walks call a shadow curriculum. This is the stuff that the foundations don't fund. This is the work that contracts don't even think about, right? They just think it's already baked into the process. And so for you to even get to the level of participatory budgeting in the, whatever sense you want, you have to build that shadow curriculum and do that training. And that's something that we're still working on now. And we're trying our best to get it funded through, through government grants and contracts by saying this is this is a critical part of workshops, right? How to do emails, how to work, how to use Google Suites, right? Like that is a skill unto itself. And so I think you need to build in that, that again, year zero that trust building, that, 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 that those technical skills you need to do that to participate fully in uh, participatory budgeting. Um, I think there are pilot, uh, pilots happening across the country around participatory budgeting, and I think there has been a successful one in a community in New York. I don't know off the top of my head, but I can uh, put the link in the um, app after this, uh, I was going to say after the show. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Let's see. Let's... Hi, um, uh, I'm Charis Rosario with Latinos Access in Orange County. We, we have been using the Promotora model since day one when we, uh, our um, funder in 1993 started the organization. So, and when we said Promotores, so Promotores Community Health Workers is well, well known in public health. Um, you can have Promotores are like youth or five year old. So it's this peer, peer to peer approach. So instead of like you thinking that you're the expert that you're gonna change the, the communities, you actually create the space for the community to flourish and, 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 and do uh, and organize them. So you just provide the space. So thank you. I love to hear you like we're, 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 we're pretty much uh, yes <laughs> so i love to hear that and, and i'm glad to hear it in this type of spaces and, and with mobility this uh you cannot often hear like the promotor model in this type of, of work right M mainly in public health so i'm glad that you're also connecting this and you, you're giving this space for us to actually think in that approach i want to ask you like it's has been a challenge for you to convince public officials or cities or funders to give you funding that to projects that are going to be lead, uh, led by promotores or lead by promotores. Foundations like it because a lot of foundations are about equity. And so, a city or, or SCAD. 
Skag. Well, in Southern California, the Skag. Yeah, so Skag, uh, yeah. they funded actually uh, one of our Puramatora programs, which we applied for. Um, I don't know if I should share this, but the Weingart Foundation recently is putting money uh, because they liked our Promotora program. I will tell you though, when it comes to our individual donors, that's where the trouble is. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> and what about, because it happened to me, we, we were part of the active transportation, Sanan active transportation plan. We were in charge of all the community outreach and engagement. And when we were doing the budget, we said we need um, allocate funding for food or for stipends, or we need to pay for a park because where we, it's where we hold the, the community workshops. And a lot of that funding or that expenses were not covered by them. So it has to be out of our pocket. So do you experience the same thing? Um, Cause they don't, they don't validate the, the, those type of, those are strategies providing food. Like I always say like, you need to have the three F fun, uh, friendly and food, but they don't consider that strategies for our reach or retention. So how do you deal with that? It, when you say it comes out of our pocket, you mean, yeah, you're right. It comes out of our general funds. Mm -hmm. The number, we had to dip into our just general funds that were not tied to a grant or a contract for community fund, for doing a block party because community, so if our promotors come to us and say, we want to do a community block party, if we have the resources, who am I to say no though? Because that they see that as a tool for their community to, to do the work and to get to reach their goal. And so there have been times where we had to reach outside of our grant to fund those kind of projects. And it's a matter of educating funders. And I don't know if we're doing as nonprofits, maybe we should band together and create our own union yeah. to educate funders. Because, and one thing that we did recently is we did a reverse RFP where we released an RFP. Yeah, and we asked funders y'all should come here and apply to this RFP. And this is how much it costs. This is what you want to pay for. Come. And I got all this great secret responses by the foundation. Oh, we liked it. We liked it. But only a few actually came out. And so we're still waiting for more. So some foundations definitely are moving towards it, which, which is really great to hear. But I think... I think there's to be no more organizing amongst organizing nonprofits. So... Mm. Oh, sorry, I have another one. And how... For us, it was really hard at the beginning to submit proposals to Caltrans or OTS. Obviously, you need to always uh, need to have um, a public entity like a city partner up with you or you partner with the city in order to apply for funding. But also the process of filling out all the paperwork that they require. You're not eligible for a lot of things. And like how you deal with that or how you handle that. You have to get paperwork. on a portal. You have yeah. to like release a statement every three days to let them know that uh -huh. you're bidding. We haven't had to go through that yet. Most of the contracts have been through invitation or through another a more traditional process. So there, there are a class of contracts we don't pursue because it's just too complicated and we don't have the bandwidth as an organization. And that's why if I could hire someone, yeah, it would be someone to help me with, with exploring contracts or better yet, how do we get a promotora to pursue the contracts without me, without needing us? Because in a way our, our team began as community organizers and now we've become almost like job, growth supporters or, or what is it like career developers i don't know what the term is in that field where we're helping them secure contracts and so it's we just need we need to build again we need to have that shadow curriculum to build the community's capacity to pursue these contracts on their own. And so we're talking about promotoras. Do you want to create your own business, your own LLC? So you can pursue these on your own and not have to go through an individual person or a group like us. But it's all about building that capacity. Thank you for those questions. Any other questions from the audience? Awesome. Let's give it up for yourselves, audience. So maybe just to wrap up, if, if both of you could just share a little bit um, in terms of um, how either our audience members can get involved or a call to action that you'd like to, to get out there. Um, I think it was in the response that I gave before, but um, I think supporting the legislation AB 2438 would be um, would be helpful just because it better aligns our transportation funding with climate and equity goals. Um, so that would be like calling to the legislator. I think it's also visiting the um, report card that climate plan created. 
which I'm sorry, I don't have the link and it's gonna be one of those like, visit this website. Um, so it's climateplanca.org slash report card. And you know what? I actually could drop it in the Hoover, so I'm gonna do that. <laughs> We have a fundraiser coming up, end of the month. So I'll put that in the good idea. I'll put it on the Hoovas, Hoover, Hoover as well. And the second thing is, I don't know, I kind of like the idea of working with more nonprofits. So I'd love to talk with nonprofits about how we can maybe like band, band together and uh, do some systems change. Thank you both. And um, if anyone is interested in joining the California Mobility Justice Advocates Network, feel free to reach out to myself, um, check out our principles document that we just reviewed um, and share it with your networks um, and if you have trouble you know with the QR code or whatever just feel free to email me and, and I can get it to you um, but with that that concludes our session and I'll give you a few minutes back so you can go chill before the next session a great job Axel moderating thanks everyone